Hi, everyone. Welcome to our virtual space here. Um, I think our flow is, well, it's still kind of, people are still steadily coming in, um, but I might as well begin my, you know, pre-event logistics. So let's, let's go ahead and start that so we can get this conversation, conversation going. Um, again, welcome to this Montana Book Festival MBF Plus event. Uh, it is taking place in partnership with Fact and Fiction Books here in Missoula, Montana. Uh, we took February off and we're back with three really, really wonderful events this month in March, um, including this one tonight. And we have more events coming to you this spring. So keep an eye out on for those. Uh, my name is Lauren Korn. I'm the director of the Montana Book Festival. Um, as usual, I kind of want to take care of some housekeeping before we turn things over to Rob and Jamie tonight. Um, first off, if you're interested in purchasing copies of Rob's book, The Grizzly in the Driveway, I urge you to purchase them from our festival partner, Fact and Fiction Books, who has agreed to donate 10% of all book sales of festival titles, including MBF Plus titles, um, back to the festival. So you go to factandfictionbooks.com and enter MBF at checkout and we'll get 10% of those proceeds. So help support the, the festival. Um, regarding questions, audience questions, uh, feel free to submit your questions to Rob and Jamie via the Q&A at the bottom of your screens. Um, here on the back end of things, uh, we'll be reading questions. Uh, Jamie is actually going to try to address your questions during the conversation and rather than address them at the end. So um, he'll be keeping an eye on them there and I'll monitor the chat to make sure that any questions um, are, th are thrown back into the Q&A. Um, and I'll be throwing out some links too. Um, with that though, I'd like to introduce you to Rob and Jamie. Author Rob Cheney is a lifelong resident of Montana, a veteran reporter for the Missoulian and a 2020 Neiman Fellow. He is the author of our featured book tonight, The Grizzly in the Driveway, The Return of Bears to a Crowded American West. There he is, hi Rob. Jamie Jonkel is a wildlife management specialist who brings over 45 years of experience with wildlife management and conflict reduction to his position with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. He has worked in Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Alaska, New Mexico, Canada, and Russia with various private and public entities, including National Geographic, Hornocker Wildlife Research Institute, Glacier Institute, Interagency Grizzly Bear Study, Glacier National Park Wolf Ecology Project, Idaho Fish and Game, Maine Fish and Wildlife, Border Grizzly Bear Project, and several privately owned branches. He has been with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks since 1996. Jamie received his bachelor's in wildlife biology and a minor in journalism from the University of Montana here in Missoula. Welcome Rob and welcome Jamie. Oh, and I guess I, I, should, note, I should note that um, Jamie doesn't have video tonight. So we're not going to see him um, and all his glory, but we will hear his wonderful voice. So welcome, Rob. Welcome, Jamie. I'm going to turn it over to you. Really happy to be here. Thank you all for joining us. Yeah, and uh, th thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm looking forward to our discussion and uh, be glad you don't have a uh, video of me. I'm looking pretty scruffy and a little, a little sloppy right now. So um, I... I guess uh, with that, uh, you know, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, Rob, I, I really enjoyed your book. I uh, have a little cabin uh, up in the Blackfoot Valley um, that I have to snowmobile into. And, and I curled up with your book uh, over about three different weekends and read through it and uh, very much enjoyed it. And uh, uh, I highly recommend it. And I know you got some uh, good reviews from uh, Kirkus and uh, Hollywood Soapbox and uh, Litany West, the Missoulian, of course. And uh, everyone uh, thought it was wonderful. Um, <laughs> I, so there's some crazy times going on right now in the politics of Grizzly. And um, 
I, for one, uh, have to be a little careful. It's dangerous times for grizzly bears and it's uh, dangerous times for uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks bear managers and uh, bear uh, scientists. Um, but I, I think your book is very, very timely and uh, <clears throat> it might be good for you to give the audience a quick synopsis of sort of what I'm talking about. Well, I just actually spent all day today uh, reviewing legislative testimony uh, before the transmittal. There's a bunch of bills coming through to rearrange the way Montanans manage and relate to grizzly bears. And that was a big part of the reason why I decided to write this book was um, after literally decades of this very slow incremental effort to try to recover a species that uh, for most of that time, very few people ever actually saw or encountered. Um, all of a sudden the tempo just started to, to scramble. Um, in 2007, we had the, the first attempt to delist greater Yellowstone grizzlies and that fell apart and that triggered a whole bunch of new research and part of the reason that that thing fell apart was how quickly uh, some food sources for bears just vanished. Um, the, the court in large part threw out that delisting effort because white bark pine and cutthroat trout in Yellowstone uh, were suddenly questionable as to whether or not they were a food source. And the reason they had become questionable was because after the fires of 1998 and then uh, the uh, pine bark beetle, the white bark pine had just about been wiped out from Yellowstone. And the introduction of lake trout in Yellowstone Lake had suddenly wiped out the cutthroat. And so changes were happening really fast. And I also saw, um, Forgive me, uh, the, the passing of your father, Jamie, or uh, Chuck Jonkel, was a just sort of a earth shaking moment when I realized that this one generation of people, one class of biologists and policymakers mm -hmm. and uh, people who were interested in bears had gone through their entire careers and were now directors of agencies or retiring or in the case of your father passing on and their entire career had been from the bear almost being gone to the bear almost being recovered. And I thought that's, that's the right time to try to figure out what did we just do and how fast do we have to finish the job. Well, um, <clears throat> yes, I, I, your book will give everyone an excellent background, you know, on uh, uh, how things uh, were 40 years ago and how things have changed in 40 years. And uh, uh, you're probably going to have enough material in the next couple of years uh, to write a whole second book. So uh, uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, um, in just this year. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. kidding. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, go ahead. in the in your book, I, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, uh, and was proud that you mentioned my father. Um, and you wrote about, you know, the incident dad had where he had to shoot a grizzly uh, years ago in self defense. And uh, dad actually was asked to write an article. Uh, for um, what was then sort of Montana Outdoors. It's not the same as Montana Outdoors. And he actually drafted the article and he just didn't feel comfortable, you know, having it published. And then a good friend of his named Jim Rice, who was a filmmaker up in Whitefish, uh, convinced Chuck to uh, try writing the story again. So Jim produced a pretty good document and uh, at the last minute, you know, dad said, no, no, I, I don't want to uh, have it published. And uh, after father died, I found both copies of uh, 
of those two articles. And uh, someday I'd love to show you those. I think you'd uh, very much enjoy reading them. Um, but I was uh, just curious, uh, you know, uh, when was the first time you, you met my father? What was the situation or where, was, where, where did you first meet him? So I had seen him on occasion uh, helping put together the um, International Wildlife Film Festival right here in Missoula, which uh, Chuck Jonkel was instrumental in changing the way that we looked at wildlife and particularly the popular versions of wildlife. Um, where, you know, we had had all of these uh, nature faker, really uh, humanized stories of, of cute critters or exciting critters or, or otherwise pretty imaginary critters. And, and he set up a film festival that required scientific rigor and actual field work and uh, really kind of kicked to the curb the, the Disney-fied, you know, lemmings jumping off a cliff, uh, nature faker stuff. And so I'd sort of known about him from that. And then when I was a very young reporter at the Hungry Horse News, I got assigned to cover one of his classes up at the Glacier Institute. And that happened to be the time that he, uh, uh, I got to hear him tell the story of uh, catching a grizzly bear in a black bear snare. And he and a partner were uh, trying to figure out what to do. And the bear, there was a log between them and the bear and the bear came over the log and the partner who had the shotgun, if I'm telling this right, Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the partner fell over and Chuck was uh, in the middle and the bear was coming at him and all Chuck had was a Colt Woodsman 22 caliber pistol, uh, which is just a little bit bigger than a BB gun. And he shot the bear right in the head and the bullet went kapwing right off the bear's forehead. And he shot it again and again and again, and the bullets just kept bouncing off the bear's head, but it would back up and recover and shake itself loose and come back again. And he finally, um, forgive me for folks who are, are uh, not used to this kind of detail, but he finally put one straight up the eye socket and that killed the bear. It turned out to be, I believe, the last bullet in the gun. And then he reaches up and he pulls up the skull of that bear and shows us the little tiny hole in the eye socket that finished the job. And so, you know, we're all in the thrall of this great bear story. It's like, wow, these are, these are really cool. And this is a guy who's really been there. But then, and this is, this is what made it so, so really, really um, gripping. We went out into Glacier Park and drove up the going to the sun road like every other tourist does. And Chuck gets out on a, on a roadside turnout and we all go follow him and he walks straight into the alder thicket. And anybody who's ever been caught in an alder thicket knows that it's, it's the worst kind of jungle you can find in the Alpine. Um, this stuff is just thick and it, you can't punch your way through it. And Chuck gets down on all fours and goes in. And we realize that there's a trail as wide as the High Line Trail right through this thicket that bears have made for centuries. And they've got a maze of these trails going in places we never even realized they could go. And then he reaches over and he pulls out what I thought was a piece of grass. And it turns out it's a wild onion. And you take a bite of that wild onion and you've got that flavor in your mouth for the rest of the day, and probably on your breath. And you suddenly realize how to see the world like a bear. And then you realize what kind of an impact he had on every single person who went through his class and got this understanding of how to see the world through another creature's existence. Yeah, he was, uh, he was quite the character. I'm actually uh, staring at the skull right now. Uh, I hate to say this, uh, his ashes are right there too. Um, uh, father left us with a rather uh, difficult assignment. Um, I didn't know this until I watched a film that was put together on my father called uh, 
Walking Bear Comes Home, um, Great Bear Foundation put it together. And um, uh, it's kind of fun to watch. Uh, but in there, he uh, talks about where he wants his ashes. And he wants his ashes uh, in the middle of James Bay, uh, Quebec, uh, up on North Twin Island in this one bear den. And, uh, I, you know, I, I put some of his ashes in with my mother and uh, took him to a, a few to a couple of special places around here. And then uh, when they did a Churchill Travelers trip a few years ago, they took some ashes up there as well. But uh, my assignment to uh, get the remaining ashes up to uh, the bear den in the middle of James Bay uh, has created a little bit of a dilemma for me. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> but, especially if that den's still occupied. Yeah, but that's dead. Uh, you know, he never really felt right about having to put down that bear. You know, he quite often talked to me about the errors they had made that day. Um, but the skull has been a very uh, excellent education prop, and is always quite a little surprise when people can uh, look at it and uh, and see those. Uh, uh, you know, dents in the skull from the 22 and then the actual entry. So my father is very, very lucky. Yep. So I know that you uh, started your career with the Hungry Horse News. And, um, you know, really the Hungry Horse News uh, sort of was right there um, when a lot of the nation's attention focused in on grizzlies and Glacier Park, the management of grizzlies, and uh, with Jack Olson's book, uh, Night of the Grizzlies. But I know that uh, Mel Reuter, uh, you know, started the Hungry Horse News, and he was right on top of all, all of that uh, reporting when those uh, two gals were killed on the same night by two different grizzlies. I was wondering if your experience there at uh, Hungry Horse News, and I was also curious if you'd ever got to meet Mel Reuter, mm -hmm. wondering if that sort of might have led to some of your interest uh, covering grizzly bears today and, and writing this book. That, that had a huge influence, but not quite the way you'd expect. Um, so I did get to, to know Mel a little bit. He wasn't he had retired from publishing at that point, and Brian Kennedy was the editor and publisher at the time. Um, Brian had a sort of a standing rule for us that uh, any bear picture we got went on the cover, and any time we had a bear on the cover, circulation jumped 30% that week. So, I mean, it was a driving force. And uh, full disclosure, uh, in all of my years at the Hungry Horse News, I never put a grizzly bear on the cover. I got a lot of black bears up there, but I never actually got close enough to a grizzly bear to get a Hungry Horse News quality shot of one. Um, but the, the coverage of the Night of the Grizzlies uh, is, a, is a really fascinating historical event when you think of everything else that got tangled around up with it because that was, that happened at the same time, and I'll try to compress a whole bunch of stuff into one place here. But John and Frank Craighead were the two instrumental grizzly researchers in Yellowstone National Park, and they kind of laid the groundwork for grizzly biology. They also pioneered the whole radio collar concept. The first radio callers uh, were done in the early 1960s on marmots, and the second radio callers were done on grizzly bears. <laughs> and they uh, kind of revolutionized what we could learn about bears, because before that, all we could do was hang uh, streamers out of their ears as a way to identify which bear was which at a distance that was safe enough to, uh, to work with. And the Craigheads had this long running and very popular, uh, very social media conscious back in the 1960s and the Mutual of Omaha, Wild Kingdom and, and uh, Walt Disney and, and all these other uh, National Geographic um, TV dinner kinds of, of opportunities where they would show what was going on with the bears. And then 
a new administration came into Yellowstone and 1972 was Yellowstone's centennial. And they were trying to figure out how do we, uh, you know, record the century of the park and what do we need to do to spruce it up? And one of the things they were really concerned about was the unnaturalness of things in the park. They wanted to get everything back to natural. And one of the first things they looked at was the Craighead brothers bears with these streamers and radio collars running around. And they thought, this is unnatural. We need to get rid of this. And at the same time, they were saying, you know, Yellowstone had a huge thing about setting up bleachers around the garbage dumps for all the big hotels. And they'd have spotlights and they'd bring everybody out right after dinner around sunset to watch the grizzlies come out of the forest and poke their way through the garbage dumps looking for food. And the Craigheads had done a lot of research on these garbage bears. So they, the park administration said, we are going to get rid of the dumps. These are unnatural. Um, we're shutting them down. And the Craigheads protested saying, if you do that, you're gonna wind up with a whole bunch of bears who are accustomed to this food source and don't have a replacement. Trouble's gonna happen. And this debate was going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And then 1967 happens up in Glacier and two women on two separate campgrounds are killed by two separate bears on the same night. And now, if that's not a black swan, low probability event, I, I don't know a better definition. Yeah, that, that was insane. Everybody out. Yeah. And, and there's really an excellent documentary that's not glorified that was put together, oh boy, it's been 10 years ago now, but it was called Night of the Grizzlies. Uh, that, that is very much worth reading. Uh, Jack Olson's book is very much worth reading, but it was really, that was when the tide turned. Um, you know, we pretty much, uh, you know, emasculated the grizzly uh, prior to that. And when, uh, you know, Yellowstone Park uh, sort of uh, became a park and Glacier Park, uh, you know, uh, the image of uh, the Teddy Roosevelt teddy bear kind of took over. And, uh, you know, granted the bear populations at that time were so low, but it was that night uh, that really changed uh, everything. And, uh, and really, uh, you cover that wonderfully in the book with the whole explanation of uh, all the animosity between the park and the Craighead brothers and the closing of the dumps and, and all the turmoil where everyone started focusing on grizzlies. And really, you know, that's uh, when the endangered, they were you know, the Endangered Species Act came into being, the grizzly bears was pl were placed on the Endangered Species Act. And uh, that's when, you know, the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee sort of was established. And it wasn't a congenial thing, you know. It, it was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service more or less saying, you know, listen, Glacier National Park, listen, Yellowstone National Park, listen, State of Montana, State of Wyoming, you guys are messing things up. And, uh, and hence, uh, you will be working together on the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. Yep. And, uh, that whole process was fascinating. And I, I love the way you covered it in, in your book. And uh, uh, I don't know if you want to give people a quick little synopsis of uh, how that changed things, what direction it put things in. So... The, the Craighead brothers got essentially ejected from Yellowstone and Yellowstone bears immediately uh, got ejected from the dumps and they started going as predicted into the campgrounds and the parking lots and everywhere else and more than a hundred bears were killed by park rangers or biologists or other bear managers in conflicts in like the next year and a half. It was just a disaster. Um, but on a really odd personal note, I grew up in Missoula, Montana, and I would ride my bike along Campus Drive at the base of Mount Sentinel 
And as I'd pass the uh, the gym that's now the ROTC headquarters there, um, I'd look down. If you hit just the right spot, you'd see a golden eagle in a cage down there. And that was always my, my little landmark, a really cool thing for the day, if you could see the golden eagle. That golden eagle was John Craighead's. The Craighead brothers, by the way, uh, if you um, ever read the book, My Side of the Mountain, that was their sister uh, writing about her crazy brothers learning how to be falconers and, and eagle raisers. The guy who had the job of exercising that eagle for John Craighead was a man named Chris Servine. And Chris Servine went from his time at the University of Montana learning to be a wildlife biologist to working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And the grizzly got put on the endangered species list in 1975. Nobody really quite knew what to do or how to fix it until 1984, when a guy named Ron Wauer, you might be pronouncing that wrong, wrote a memo saying, in this time when we're all sitting here spinning our wheels, we may lose the grizzly bear entirely. It's gonna disappear on our watch, except for a couple of little remnant populations in Glacier and Yellowstone, if we don't do something right away. And Servine happened to be working for water. And so everybody at Washington was scratching their heads, trying to figure out what to do. And they said, okay, let's come up with a plan. And Servine helped draft it together to create a thing called the Interagency Grizzly Committee. And the, uh, the directors of the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Forest Service handed it to the governors of Montana, Idaho, Washington, and Wyoming, and not the wildlife managers. And the governors, whether they were really deeply involved or maybe were just signing something on the fly, all signed off on it. And all of a sudden this committee was there and it had the power to make everybody else, all those state fish and wildlife agencies and the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management and the Department of the Interior and the Indian tribes who had reservations in grizzly country and the National Park Service and even the Canadians who had uh, parks and, and wild country right on our border, all get together in a room and start working on this thing. And so that sort of stroke of bureaucratic luck put everybody together in harness to try to figure out how to save the bear. And I've got to say, those are for something as exciting as grizzly bears, those are some of the most really boring meetings I have had to attend. <laughs> But yeah, I I have to agree. I have to agree. I uh, I, I remember sitting at many a, many a meeting and slightly nodding off and looking over and seeing you <laughs> taking notes, but uh, seeing your head bobbing a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, when the interagency grizzly bear committee first started, you know, it, uh, it was kind of uh, yeah, you know, a little tense. But uh, over time. Uh, uh, you know, it, it was heavy on bureaucracy, but over time, I mean, uh, the sleeves got rolled up and uh, there was a lot of transition, new people coming in continually and uh, worked pretty hard, you know, and uh, <clears throat> I think uh, having that structure uh, overseeing the management of a species like the grizzly is really one of a kind, at least functioning at that high a level. Um, and, uh, you know, great headway has been made. I mean, uh, we definitely, uh, are seeing grizzlies showing up all over, you know, they're covering and, um, uh, you know, 40 years, um, you know, uh, you know, they, what do they say? A generation is, uh, roughly 25 years for a human. I just took a guess and figured a generation for a grizzly bear was probably 12, 13, something like that. In just this very short time, you know, two human generations and, uh, you know, four or five grizzly generations, uh, our uh, bears have uh, really done quite well. Um, so I'm going to just change the subject a little bit because I was fascinated with this story. Um, when you were 
working with um, uh, the Hungry Horse News, uh, you got to meet Leo Turner. Yeah. I had always heard the rumors, you know, and I had heard the stories about that incident, but I was like, wow, that, that's pretty far-fetched, you know, that, that could it really be that way, you know, and I, I, I got some insight from uh, Tim Manley and some of the wardens and stuff, but really when I read your book, that was the first time I, I got a feeling for the whole story, and it's really quite an amazing story. Uh, you might want to give people just a quick little uh, nibble on that one. Sure. So the the story started with uh, just a tip that some crazy old Vietnam vet had killed a grizzly bear with a knife. Go find him. And nobody knew who he was. Uh, the whole incident was under investigation. So we weren't releasing names. We weren't releasing any details of, the, of where it happened or anything like that, except that it was somewhere vaguely in the area of uh, Big Fork. And Brian Kennedy told me, go find him. So I went out and literally went door to door just banging on people's doorbells and saying, have you heard about this incident where somebody uh, killed a bear on uh, last Friday before last? And eventually they led me to Leo Turner. Um, and I'm thumbing through the book here because I've got a picture of him. I, I found his place and there's just this wall of dog barking going on. There. And I'm like, oh boy, what am I walking into? It's a Rottweiler farm. Leo Turner raised Rottweilers. And so I walk up to the door thinking I'm going to have my leg bit off any moment here. And this very nice, very small man with two gigantic Rottweilers at his side comes out and says, what can I do for you? And I say, I, I hear that something wild happened here. He says, oh, yeah, let me show you. Um, and so we uh, go out to his backyard and he had this kennel for his dogs and it was crushed. And the kennel uh, rails are made out of two by sixes and they are snapped. And he says, I was hearing my dogs making these weird noises and I came out to see what was going on and something came lunging out and uh, I shot it and I jumped back way farther than I thought I ever could and way farther than my doctor who uh, since I've got bronchitis says I should ever be able to move uh, but I don't know what it was and so I went back and uh, got a friend and a flashlight and my friend came out with a uh, double barrel shotgun and I came out with a pistol in my belt and a knife in my hand because in the dark a knife is better I'm like who has this idea of a knife is better in the dark when you're after something that's big enough to scatter a Rottweiler can? And here's, here's Leo and his kennel. So if you can see it there. And he says, well, you know, that's what they taught me to do in the A-team in Vietnam. And at, at that time, you know, this is 1999, um, the A team for me was the TV show with Mr. T and face. And, you know, I love it when a plan comes together and I pity the fool and this, this totally, uh, you know, made up melodramatic goofball, uh, Thursday night TV stuff. No, no. Leo Turner was a member of the special forces A team and he had his certificate on the wall. And he went out in the dark with bronchitis and a K-bar in his hand. And when he saw something on the ground and it moved, he jumped on it and stabbed it. And it turned out to be a grizzly bear so big, it took a winch on a pickup truck and three men to get it out of his yard. And they <laughs> determined, uh, I think pretty reasonably, that it was a case of, of uh, justifiable self-defense and he was never charged for the incident. Um, 
but that's the kind of bears that are running around right on the edge of people's houses on the edge of uh, the Rocky Mountains where we all live. And it really kind of brings home how close we are to bear country and how close bears are to our country. And, you know, what are we going to do about that? Um, and I wish I had an answer. I wish I had a good strategy or a, a way to make people comfortable who really don't like the idea of bears or the way to make bear fans understand the visceral fear that people who don't like bears have um, and try to find some middle ground for them. Um, you know, when I was listening to the testimony uh, from the legislature today and the people were talking about how, you know, I can't have my grandkids come over to Shoto anymore and go fishing with me because there's bears in the fishing holes. Um, you know, who's going to send their grandkid out where a 500 pound predator might run off with them? On the other hand, um, you know, grizzly bears and wolves are one of the biggest financial draws for people who come to Glacier and Yellowstone National Park. They are a huge support to our local economy for people who come out for a chance to see one and snap a picture of one. And like any keystone predator, they are a massive part of the ecosystem balance that is going to keep all the rest of the species underneath them in play and in check. And I don't have a good solution for that. But part of the reason I wrote this was to at least give people the ammunition to ask better questions and to try to think of what do I really feel about these bears or what are the things that I have never really thought about that other people are worried about and that I ought to at least have some encounter with. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> it's, it's fascinating uh, for me, and I'm sure you've seen it as well, just how different people think about grizzlies from one area to another. Um, you know, like um, I'll be in Missoula, uh, and, and folks in Missoula are totally different than folks in Darby and people in Darby are totally different than the folks that live down by St. Regis. And then, uh, you know, you, you go over to the university, uh, completely different philosophies. Uh, uh, everyone, you know, always has this concept of how it should be done. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of opinions on how it should be done. And what always strikes me is so many of the people I talk to look at it too simply. You know, they, they always have these sort of cut and dry, you know, like, well, this is what needs to be done. You know, we just need to play music to the bears and uh, they can live in harmony with us if you sing to them. And then another guy is like, well, you know, you put a little strict nine on the weenies and hang them on the barbed wire. <laughs> no more grizzly problem, you know. And you just get, it, it's crazy. It's insane. But people don't seem to see all the intricacies, all the little innuendos uh, of how difficult it is to manage a species like a grizzly bear or an elephant or a polar bear or any animal, you know, that, that is large in, uh, in this world today. And um, I was just, you know, you, you address that in your book, but, uh, you know, uh, in, in your interviews, you talk to a lot of different people. And the one that really struck me was, uh, you know, your chapter on um, the spirit animal. <laughs> yeah. Looking at, at it from the Indian perspective. And uh, I, I'm glad you did that. Yeah, they, um, you know, you, you talk about everybody having different attitudes about bears. Um, one of the things that really kind of amazed me was within 
uh, Indian cultures. And I'm, I'm, I want to be very careful here. I'm not an ethnographer or a tribal member or, or any other sort of authority on this other than what is publicly available. But um, the bear in so many indigenous cultures is itself an incredibly mixed uh, character. Um, let me literally give you an example here. This is a, a little carved bear that I like to keep on my desk. Um, and it's made by a uh, Salish artist. And, you know, it's got the two sides of its, of its existence. It's, it's a actual animal and it is a spiritual creature. And within just, for example, uh, the Kootenai tribe, uh, which, you know, we're living on Kootenai land here, um, a collection of Kootenai Y stories I have, the grizzly is the, uh, the leader of the council of animals, um, the giver of wisdom, the provider of medicine, the rudest, most obnoxious animal in the whole uh, neighborhood, the one that is, is uh, the most mischievous and um, frequently uh, violent and, and unfriendly, the one that is um, the most powerful, the one that is often the dumbest, the one that is the easiest to fool, the one that is the most wise and uh, the biggest source of, of uh, necessary information. It's just, you know, like the entire Greek pantheon of gods all smashed into one critter, sometimes within the same story. And when I, you know, started looking at that and seeing how all of these other uh, communities relate to charismatic megafauna like the bear, it really brought up the point that when we are doing something, you got to ask who's we, you know, are, are we the interagency grizzly bear committee? Are we the Montana legislature? Are we Congress? Are we the United States versus Canada? Are we North America versus uh, Eurasia where there's a whole lot of bears and all the way down to Mongolia and, and Morocco? Um, and we have all of these different ways of working with them and different uh, ways of respecting them and including them in our mythology and our spirituality and our economy. Um, it, all of a sudden I had to go back through the book page by page and check how many times I used the word we. And <laughs> if I yeah. was conscious about who I thought we was. And, and I realized I didn't know. I included people who probably didn't think that they belonged in that week, that they were radically opposed to in the community that I thought we all belonged to. Yeah, it's uh, it's really, uh, you know, I, I always laugh, you know, like, you know, I find myself doing it once in a while. You know, I'm a fourth generation Montana, you know, I'm, uh, you know, when you, when you think about uh, the first people here, in the Americas, I mean, thousands and thousands of uh, generations uh, just living with with grizzlies and black bears, and and really in Europe, you know, uh, our in our past, the European past, you know, uh, grizzlies, uh, grizzly mythology, uh, very important, uh, going way way back, and uh, and things have certainly changed. I. Uh, you know, really, I brought this up in a little presentation I did the other day uh, for the uh, Traveler's Rest folks in a winter storytelling session. But I just got to thinking about the length of time, you know, that European man has been here. And, and you know, the Vikings arrived uh, in 1000, you know, and then 500 years went by. And then uh, the Europeans arrived. Um, you know, we had this... Spanish uh, uh, via Christopher Columbus uh, start, uh, you know, 
uh, checking the interior out. We had the French arrive. We had the British arrive. And really, another 500 years went by, mm-hmm. roughly to, to today's date. And, and uh, the, the change that had occurred in just that short time, it made me think about these old devils. You know, you always hear about the, the old woman that lived to 120, you know, right in the old folks' home. You know, I'm like, whoa, 120. Well, when you think about that and you go back 120 years, you know, you think, well, there was another old timer that might have lived to 120 <laughs> and another one, another one. You know, that's uh, five or six old timers, uh, you know, since European man arrived in North America. And my God, the change that has occurred is just uh, mind boggling. Uh, and um, yeah, it just it really makes me think about things. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, you know, in 50 years, what do you see? In 100 years, what do you see? In 500 years, <laughs> God forbid, what do you see? Well, um, l- let me back up a little bit before I jump forward that far. Think of what we've done just in the time that we've been trying to recover the grizzly bear. We had the Craighead brothers right around the time I was born coming up with the first radio caller. And all that radio caller could do was beep to another radio and you might be able to figure out where the bear was. That was 1967. And now I've got this in my hand And I have holding in my hand here more computing power than all of NASA had to put Neil Armstrong on the moon. Now, somebody made the point to me that if if you use, forgive me, if you use war as an example, we fought wars from Alexander the Great all the way to Napoleon at the same speed as fast as a horse could go. That was the fastest that anybody's army could move from Alexander the Great to Napoleon. And one generation later, after the Battle of Waterloo, we have the American Civil War where all of a sudden we've got steam engines, and telegraph and machine guns, and the entire world is changed. And everybody's strategy that they had worked on for literally thousands of years is thrown out the window. Now think of what we have done, you and I, and all of our audience here, just in our lifetimes. We have gone from radio callers that go beep to radio callers that tell me if a lactating grizzly bear is overheating and needs to find a bath so that she can produce enough milk for her cubs when the temperature gets above 80 degrees. And it's beamed off of a satellite and it goes to the Apple Watch on your wrist. We've tried to jam that much technology and that much artificial intelligence into our lives in the space of one generation. And you want me to guess what we're going to be doing in the next 50 years? (laughs) Um, Yeah. That's the other reason why why I wanted to put this book together is because our decision space is just collapsing like a black hole. When you factor in the challenge of climate change, when you factor in the challenge of population growth and our available resources and the mismatch that is available there, when you look at the damage that one little virus can do in this past year, what if that virus was just a little bit better? What if that virus was a little bit closer to Ebola than it was to uh, SARS? how much mayhem we would be in and whether our system that we've got set up around us is ready to handle it. And uh, yeah. How much more delicate the grizzly bear system is and we're trying to manage it like some big terrarium. I'm not sure we're up to the job. Yeah, I, uh, I worry. I daydream a lot, you know, trying to figure out what the future might look like. But uh, for, 
for as smart as a species as we're supposed to be, <laughs> yeah, I, I sure wonder about us sometimes. Uh, oh, it uh, drives me insane. And and I've had that same so thought about Ebola. I mean, it almost happened. And uh, boy, that would have been uh, so different uh, to the COVID uh, outbreak. Um, now I do see we have a question. Oh, good. Let's see, Karen Gonzalez um, says, couldn't we see bears behind the old, old gym at, uh, I guess, the University of Montana? And I can answer that. I don't know if, uh, if you guys were <coughs> following the Missoula Bears updates and some of the university dispatch uh, updates, but we uh, had a couple black bears that were uh, real characters uh i believe they came out of the rattlesnake they were fully food conditioned uh and uh we're we're slowly getting things somewhat cleaned up uh garbage wise bird feeder wise apple wise in the rattlesnake drainage but we've had a lot of bears uh on the gravy train for mm -hmm. a long time up there and they shifted over into East Missoula, Bonner, Milltown. And a couple of them uh, came out of the Hellgate Canyon area and started doing these forays all through the university district. And uh, yeah, people were seeing them up behind the, uh, the, the university. Uh, oh, it says here, no, they were in a cage by the Golden Eagles. Okay. Uh, you referring to Kerry Hunt's bears where uh, we worked out the bear spray formulas? It, we I, now, we also, at the University of Montana, had bear mascots. They actually had a grizzly as a bear mascot. Most of them were black bears. A lot of people aren't aware of this, but they had captive bears that they kept on campus and took to the various football games. This was all in the 40s. Uh, there's a, a really fascinating article on those bears. And yes, I believe some of those bears were actually kept on campus. And before that, uh, they had captive bears in Greeno Park as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've gone into Greeno Park and seen the bear cage there. But, uh, um, but who knows? You know, the Craigheads, <laughs> who knows what they were doing behind the old man's gym. Uh, they could have had a bear there as well. But uh, uh, but those two bears uh, that were all around the university were pretty cool. Uh, we're starting to see some grizzlies, you know, around Missoula. All last uh, fall, we had a grizzly bear working in the North Hills, uh, actually got into a chicken coop in the Butler Creek area. And then uh, people were seeing tracks. I uh, believe it was just one bear. But in the last 10 years or so, we're, we're starting to see a fair amount of grizzly activity in and around the Five Valleys area. We even had a, a, a second grizzly show up last year in the town of Lolo. Um, you know, the year before we had uh, a collared grizzly come out of the cabinets and uh, get pretty close to Lolo. Uh, of course, we had the Stevensville grizzly, which you talk about. Um, I really like the fact that you, um, well, it said it wasn't around the 40s. It was the early 70s. I thought it was the Craigheads. Well, you know, like I said, the Craigheads could have easily had a bear back behind there uh, uh, very easily. So, yeah, uh, they were, you know, based out of the uh, uh, science complex. And, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't have a bear <laughs> there. Uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, young John Craighead if he ever remembers uh, – anything about a bear being uh, behind the old man's gym there. Um, Amy, were you involved in the bear spray work? You know, I helped uh, dad and Carrie out with that. That was fascinating. Uh, that was right out at Fort Missoula in the old Italian prisons. Uh, during uh, World War II, they uh, had Italian war prisoners at two uh, prison sites at Fort Missoula. And uh, dad and Carrie Hunt, uh, were able to get a hold of four of those old cells and they converted them uh, where they put a trap door between the two prison cells 
and uh, they had uh, black bears, and then they had uh, several grizzlies out there as well. And yes, that's where Carrie Hunt uh, did her study on uh, aversive conditioning with bear spray. I also looked at skunk spray, ammonia, all sorts of other things. Um, those uh, pins have been shut down for quite some time. But yeah, we had captive grizzlies uh, right out there at Fort Missoula. Uh, and that was in the 70s, uh, late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. So Jamie, something I get asked a lot and you probably can lay down some serious field experience is the question of bear spray versus guns if you are encountering a, a bear. And I know you carry both, um, but what would you tell folks when they're asking the, uh, the advice for going into the woods? Well, you bet. Uh, so I carry bear, bear spray with me at all times, <laughs> mostly for, for <laughs> these angry people I have to work with <laughs> at times. Uh, but, you know, I'm far more frightened of running into uh, someone that might do bodily harm to me. You know, um, you, you just never know. So I always have bear spray for that reason. But I also, when I'm in the woods, I carry it with me at all times. Even if I troop off to the outhouse from the cabin, which is 100 feet away, I carry a can of bear spray and I have a can of bear spray in the outhouse. Um, when people uh, are recreating right around the town of Missoula, I tell them to carry bear spray because... Uh, there are more black bears in and around the fringes of Missoula than there are up in the mountains. And it's because of this glut of food. And it all has to do with the enhancement of prime habitat. You know, uh, people often think that, you know, when people move in, they take it away from the animal to the bear, the deer, the elk or whatever. And, in the past that did occur, they were displaced. But over the last 15 to 20 years here in the West, we're starting to see what they call the, uh, uh, you know, the urban interface effect. Uh, uh, we have enhanced really good habitat by sprinkling it with water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, exotic grasses, uh, growing crab apple trees and fruit trees and plum trees and apricots and, and growing alfalfa. Uh, and so really some of the best wildlife habitat right now is this urban wildlands habitat or the agricultural interface. Uh, and uh, so I, I try to get people to carry bear spray anywhere they are in Montana and not just for bears. I mean, uh, if you get a uh, randy whitetail buck, you know, that is used to being hand fed by Grandma Jesse at uh, such and such street uh, up in the rattlesnake, you know, he in the rut might, uh, you know, want to do a little bit more than, you know, take some bread out of your hand. And it's nice to have some bear spray. Um, uh, elk, a cow elk, you know, coming after you uh, because you got too close to her, or her, her calf. Uh, comes in handy to have bear spray. Uh, a cow moose, you know, that you uh, startle uh, on the trail, you know, might be kind of handy to have a can of bear spray. Um, now, I do carry a firearm too, you know, when I'm in the backcountry, but I uh, have worked in some real remote areas, you know, like uh, up in Alaska, and I just uh, have both, you know, but it's uh, the, the bear spray that's always close at hand, and then I I have that uh, firearm there just in case I need it, you know, as a backup. Um, but, uh, you know, so many people are so quick to uh, go with the gun, uh, you know, but uh, when you think about it, with grizzlies, I mean, they are an amazingly powerful animal. They can take extreme injury and still cause harm and yeah. times if you really want to get hurt <laughs> uh best way to do that is pull out a pistol and wound a grizzly that uh might just enhance its level of attack so i strongly encourage people to go the old skunk method and uh carry bear spray yes indeed yeah 
Let's see. I see it's seven oh one. I think it was only supposed to be an hour, but uh, we'll yeah, see. You're, really, you're keeping there. track. You're keeping close track, Jamie. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more audience questions, so um, let's let's call it. Um, Rob, Jamie, thank you so much for being here. Um, to you, the audience, thank you for being here as well and for participating. Um, just as a reminder to you, you can purchase The Grizzly in the Driveway on Fact and Fiction's website online, factandfictionbooks.com. There it is in all its beauty. Um, and do remember to uh, enter MBF at checkout so that 10% of your purchase comes back to the festival um, so that we can continue programming like this. Um, we're going to be announcing our plans for the 2021 Montana Book Festival very soon, so stay tuned for that as well. Again, Rob, Jamie, thank you for your knowledge and your stories. Everyone, have a really wonderful night. Thank yep. you all. Lauren, thank, thank you so much. Shout out to uh, you and my friend Gwen Florio coming up here very soon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it started. <laughs> all right. Thanks for the all opportunity. Right. Yep. All right. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Very much.